coming up. Addressing product challenges in plant-based meats, the evolving art of sensory science, and cashing in on the upscale pet food category. All that and more, it's episode five of Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT First Annual Event and Expo. Join science of food professionals from around the world, July 16th through the 19th in Chicago. Learn more at iftevent.org. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology Magazine, where each episode we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. The desire to impact sustainability improve personal diets, and flat-out curiosity have prompted millions of consumers to try plant-based meats, poultry, and seafood. In 2019, the segment posted $900 million in U.S. grocery sales, according to Nielsen IQ. But despite strong consumer trial, a deep well of investment money, and a steady drumbeat of media attention, repeat purchases have stalled recently when consumers' product experience didn't always live up to expectations. Food Technology Science and Technology Editor Julie larson Brisher caught up with Dr. Julian McClements at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to discuss the state of the science when it comes to developing meat analogs that will resonate with consumers. Well, good afternoon, Julian. Yeah, good afternoon, Julia. It's great to be here. Well, you know, I'm really looking forward to talking with you today to get your take on the scientific challenges of developing plant-based meats. Now, we had a recent cover story on this subject, and it noted that the market for these products is faltering a little bit. Um, Consumers aren't making repeat purchases like they had just in the last few years. So, and according to that story, among the reasons that they're looking for is quality attributes like taste, moistness, juiciness, and they also want to get that functional or nutritional value from foods, but they aren't finding them in these plant-based meat products, um, even in the well-known brands. So what do you think are the biggest challenges that product developers are facing when designing plant-based meat products that have these quality attributes that consumers are looking for? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think you know, I think uh, quality attributes are incredibly important and cost is another one, especially, you know, with everyone's budget's really tight at the moment. And these products often cost in almost twice as much as, you know, regular meat kind of products. But I think, you know, the big challenge is t- trying to take plant-based ingredients and trying to simulate, you know, what you have with meat, and that's just very, very challenging because you know the the proteins in plants are designed to do something very different than the proteins in meat. So in meat, you have these very fibrous structures and a very complex structural hierarchy of these ingredients, whereas in plants you tend to have these very small globular proteins that are like golf balls. So somehow we have to string together these tiny little globular proteins to make structures that simulate the very complicated structures in meat. And that is very, very challenging. And then you have to understand, like, how do these foods interact with the human body? So, like, how does light get reflected from the surface and get the right color and opacity? Then you've got to get the right flavor profiles. You have to get the right kind of molecules in your nose and on on the taste buds on your tongue. And then it has to break down in your mouth. Uh, in a very specific way that consumers are used to, like how chicken breaks down or beef breaks down. And that's an incredibly complicated things that are going on there inside your mouth. And I think we we only at the beginning of trying to understand that. Well, you know, like you mentioned, we we know about the plant-based materials and their interactions with other materials or ingredients that are used to construct plant-based meat. But do these pose any scientific hurdles for developers who are trying to create products that have a, an appealing composition, let's say, or, or structure, or those quality attributes? Yeah, I think we just, uh, I think we often don't, we're all so used to food that we just take them for granted. But if you actually look inside of food, it's an incredibly complicated um, material. And it's much more complex than what, you know, like people in polymer science or physics would normally work with. You have hundreds of different types of molecules of all different sizes and shapes and hydrophobicities and electrical charges that are interacting with each other. And then they interact with our our senses. So I think you're just starting off with this incredible complexity. And I think the way that we try and 
deal with that moment. It's a very simplistic approach. It's almost like a, a cook and see approach where you treat the food as a black box and you change something and you see how it how that um, alters the properties. But I think we need a much more rigorous scientific approach in the future where we do apply the basic principles of physics and chemistry and biology to understand you know, how we put these different ingredients together, how that affects the sensory properties, the, the taste and the appearance and the smell of the properties, and then also how they behave inside our body after we eat them because they have to get disassembled and then absorbed by our bodies. And and that again, that's a very complicated. And we're only at the beginning of really understanding that. Well, now I know you've been quoted as saying that it's critical that we design these foods so that they're healthy from the get go. And you've talked about how many plant based foods have zero percent protein. So, do you have any suggestions about how product developers could improve the nutrition profile of these products? Well, I think at the very least, we should start trying to simulate what you know the real products like. So, if it's a real fish or it's a real meat product or real cheese, we should at least try and get the, the macronutrient and micronutrient composition equivalent. So, like the, you know, the same protein, the same fat, uh, the same carbohydrate concentrations, and then the, you know, get the right vitamins and minerals in there as well. But at the, but we can also try and make them better as well. We can fortify them with dietary fibers that might not normally be present or nutraceuticals that you would get from plants that you don't normally get from animals. So I think in the future, we can design these products to be much healthier by understanding how they get broken down in our bodies and absorbed by our bodies and by putting different kinds of sort of vitamins, minerals and nutraceuticals and probiotics and dietary fibers and things like that. So, Julian, what kinds of research or scientific endeavors are going on at your lab at University of Massachusetts Amherst? Yeah, I think uh, the whole faculty in UMass has really uh, sort of changed their research recently to focus on plant-based foods. Uh, And in in my lab, we're trying to sort of create next generation plant-based eggs and milk and cheese and meat and seafood products. And we're trying to take um, what's called a soft matter physics approach. So we're trying to understand, you know, the properties of the individual molecules and how they interact with each other and form different kinds of structures. And then relate those, the composition and the structure of the foods to things like their texture or their appearance or their water holding properties or their behavior in in the human mouth. And then the other thing we're trying to do is to make sure that the the nutrient composition of these foods is similar to that of real sort of meat or fish or other animal-based products. So, And we're doing a lot of fortification with um, nutraceuticals and fibers and things like that. What's most exciting to you? Do you are you looking forward to like a, a great cheese or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not vegan. And I think one of the reasons I'm not a vegan is because I find it really difficult to get really good plant-based yogurts or um, cheeses and products like that. So I think you know, as as the science develops and we get closer and closer to developing these, you know, then I'm more likely to, to make that final step. And, uh, you know, that should make my diet much more sustainable in the future without damaging my health. Right, right. And do you think that as a consumer, I mean, you're a food scientist and a consumer. So are you finding anything out in the market that is making you think, that's the next big thing. Like that's where we're going to hit the sweet spot quickly when it comes to the taste attributes and the quality and the nutritional value that you're looking for when you're grabbing one of these plant-based products off the shelf. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think I'd always look at nutritional label first to make sure that, you know, it's, it's nutritionally equivalent. And then, you know, the flavors it's going to be really important. And I was, I was talking to a company in California, I think Climax Foods, and they're using artificial intelligence to try and make sort of next generation plant based cheeses. And, you know, talking to the, the scientists there, they, they claim that they've got some really fantastic cheeses that are, you know, almost indistinguishable from real cheeses. So, you know, that, that I'm really excited about trying those kind of products and, and see if, if, they, if they truly are a, a great substitute. That's exciting for me because I'm on a like a low dairy type of diet lifestyle right now, but I love dairy and it, cheese is like the the king of foods if, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I'm the same. Like cheese and yogurt. I mean, they're such an yeah. important part of my life that they have to be good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, thanks, Julian, so much. You, you've given us a lot to think about today, and I appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with us. Yeah, it's been fantastic being on the show. I really enjoyed it. 
Julian McClements is a distinguished professor and director of the Old Protein Research Lab at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's also recipient of IFT's 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award in honor of Nicholas Appair and the author of Future Foods, How Modern Science is Transforming the Way We Eat. For more on this subject, check out our cover story, Rebuilding Plant-Based Meat, in the February issue of Food Technology. Only about a quarter of surveyed Americans are aware of the My Plate program from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, according to a new study from the National Center for Health Statistics. My Plate was introduced in 2011 as a replacement for the USDA's food pyramid. It presents a visual guide that divides major food groups into recommended percentages of a person's daily diet. Food Technology Associate Editor Emily Little explains the findings of the new study and next steps to raise awareness. I'm Emily Little, Associate Editor with Food Technology Magazine, and here's this episode's news story. Only about one quarter of surveyed Americans were aware of the MyPlate program from the USDA, according to a new study. Do you know what MyPlate is? Well, in case you don't, it was introduced in 2011 as a replacement for the food pyramid visual. You probably remember this visual. I remember seeing it in the cafeteria of my elementary school growing up, and it was meant to teach you that certain foods are higher than others on this pyramid. Well, rather than ranking foods that are quote unquote better for you, the USDA switched to my plate, which divides the major food groups into percentages rather than ranking them. And according to the USDA, MyPlate promotes whole fruits, a variety of vegetables and protein foods, whole grains, and low-fat or fat-free dairy. The data for this study was taken from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey from years 2017 to 2020. And this included over 9,000 participants aged 20 or older. Now, this survey is usually taken on a two-year basis, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this specific survey spans a bit longer than that time period. Participants were asked if they had heard of MyPlate, whether or not they had tried to follow the recommendations, and asked to rate their personal diets between excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. So let's get down to what they said. According to the study, 25.3% of respondents said that they had heard of the MyPlate plan, but only 8.3% of them have tried to follow the recommendations. Now, this is an increase of awareness from the 2013 and 14 survey, the last time we really looked at these numbers, where only about 20% of respondents had heard of the program, but still a relatively low number given what the USDA is trying to do here. Overall, the study found that more women than men had heard of the program, and they had tried to follow the recommendations. And those who were aware of my plate were more likely to rate their diets as excellent or very good. Some other findings of the study, that in addition to women, young adults, those with higher incomes, and those with more education were more likely to be aware of my plate. And these results are consistent with previous research showing that these specific demographics do have a higher knowledge of nutrition-related things. So it is consistent with research we have seen out there in the world. Now we just need to bring the other groups up to snuff. The researchers suggested that further studies should be done on why there are different levels of awareness in various groups and how nutritional education can be expanded to reach those that are less familiar with the program. So basically, the USDA wants to find out where their gaps are in education and then sneaking in there so that more people are aware of this program, know the benefits of it, and can try to apply it to their own lives. So the next time you make a meal, maybe bring up that My Plate visual just to make sure you're keeping on track. That's all for this time, and I'll talk to you soon. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. Did you know that FIRST stands for Food Improved by Research, Science, and Technology? Well, now you do. At IFT FIRST, attendees will experience innovation in action, research, scientific discoveries, and connect with peers new and old. The theme of this year's IFT FIRST is innovation in a time of crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Registration opens March 1st. 
Exhibitors are locking in space now. Don't miss out. Go to iftevent.org to learn more. Humans have long been intrigued by how our senses impact behavior. But it wasn't until the early 20th century that the study of sensory science became a standard tool to create foods and beverages. New technologies and methodologies are now taking sensory science to another level. Food Technologies Deputy Managing Editor Kelly Hensel spoke with Rebecca Blybaum, President and Chief of Sensory Intelligence at Dragonfly SCI, about how sensory science has evolved and why it is such a vital part of product development. So how has the role of sensory science changed since the post-World War II era when the hedonic scale and flavor profiling really got their start? You know, sensory has definitely grown and developed over the years. And I think starting out with the nine-point hedonic scale, that was a fundamental shift in how we thought about behavior because, you know, the goal was to try to get soldiers to eat more, to stay healthy, to eat more food. And, you know, trying to understand as they like products better, then they eat more of it, right? So they get better nutrition. And so understanding that as a product is better liked, it actually gets higher consumption was a very fundamental learning for the whole industry. And, you know, some of the major multinationals got wind of this information that you can have a frame panel in a quantitative way, repeatable, reliable, and valid, scientifically valid, statistically valid, correlate that and start understanding how do you increase uh, product acceptance to grow their brands. And I imagine, you know, some of the newer technologies that are being introduced are maybe helping find better methodologies to sensory science. Are there any that are exciting to you or that you've seen make a real difference? I love the sensory software companies that are out there really working to provide us with tools to organize our systems, to track the consumer responses, to collect that data, to design the questionnaires. And, you know, now so many companies are are understanding the value of sensory, but they can't afford these enterprise software systems, right? So there's some new things coming out of the craft industry, like craft brewing, for example. Uh, They came out with a really nice handheld, you can do it on your phone, (laughs) to collect data and it's really designed as a QC tool, but we've found tremendous value in that, that you can be at the source rating things. If you if you train people, like going out in the field, like we're in California, so we do a lot of uh, grape work and we have a lot of issues with fire, smoke taint and things like that. So we wanna have a system so people can be out of, in, at the source measuring things in different locations and then tracking that through the supply chain. So having the ability to measure things at the source in a handheld device so you're not, you know, it's not a big uh, outlay of expense. It's everybody has a phone, go out there, train them on what to measure, when to measure, how to measure, and uh, collect some data so you can use it for decision making. So I think that's very exciting. It's like we call it the QuickBooks of sensory (laughs) because it's inexpensive, affordable, and really anybody can do it. We're lowering the barriers of entry. I I love that. And I think that's key, obviously, in kind of addressing this last question that I have, which is making sure that sensory science is getting the credit that it's due, that the that the impact that it has on product development is known. And, you know, by obviously getting technologies into everybody's hand that allows them to do that and see the impact of sensory science, what other things can be done to kind of legitimize sensory science impact on product development? That's a great question because I I think sensory is one of those areas that's hard to get training in, right? How do you get training? And a lot of universities only offer a two-unit course as part of their whole food science program. And, you know, that's not enough. There's really, there's a lot to learn about this field and how do you make sure you have robust, reliable, repeatable data. Not all data is created equal. And we've seen some, you know, when we talk about legal cases or legal disputes, insurance claims, advertising claims, You know, we watch the literature pretty closely and are involved in a lot of these activities. And some of the data that we've seen, it just doesn't hold up in a court of law. You know, if you're trying to provide evidence, how much evidence do you need to support your objective? And sometimes that evidence is really lacking. So we want to raise the credibility of this field, raise the ability for companies to believe in sensory data so that as they scale up, they can, you know, we small data to predict to a larger population. And that is a challenge because some people, you know, how do you, uh, how do you learn how to do that? Design a robust experiment 
and provide that and track it through the system to make sure you're delivering value. Rebecca Blybaum, President and Chief of Sensory Intelligence at Dragonfly SCI, has over 30 years' experience applying sensory and consumer research with major multinational businesses. Read more about the evolving study of sensory science in the February issue of Food Technology. During the COVID-19 pandemic, millions of homebound Americans became devoted pet owners, pouring money into upmarket, health-oriented pet food brands, including a few that rode home delivery and online subscriptions to rapid growth. One of those emerging companies, PetPlate, secured nearly $30 million in funding in 2021, thanks in part to exposure on Shark Tank. Described as the blue apron of pet foods, PetPlate charges between $150 and $400 a month for carefully concocted pet food using human-grade meats and vegetables delivered to customers' doorsteps. Food Technologies' Emily Little spoke with Pet Plate's founder about the state of the pet food industry, his product, and how he sees the category growing in the future. Ronaldo, thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you so much for having me, Emily. So I've been doing a little bit of research on the pet food category, and I want to get your opinion on why you think this category specifically has grown so much. Yeah, there are a lot of exciting things happening in, in the pet category that are really driving growth. But one of the fundamental shifts that's happened that's driving this is what we call the humanization of pets. If you really look at what's happened, you know, uh, in, in the pet space over the you know, past 20 or 30 years, pets have just become a deeper part of the family. And thus, we are putting a lot of our traits, wants, and desires onto our dogs, whether that uh, takes the form in food or dressing your dog up for Halloween, or even as simple as, you know, dogs used to be outside, now they sleep in the bed with you. That has really evolved. And as a part of that, the expectations for products and services have evolved. And that's allowed brands like Pet Plate to come in and to challenge the status quo and to offer better products for pet parents. So even though we have seen a slight increase in the number of pets over the past 20 years, we've seen a bigger increase in what the average pet parent spends on their dog or cat. And that's really just driven by, you know, the larger share they take up of our hearts, really. And what exactly are consumers looking for in their pet food? Yeah, specifically with pet food, what we find is that the pet food category is really maybe call it five to 10 years, depending on the trend behind the human food category. So if you look at what happened in human food, there was a huge boom in the better for you and the natural and the organic space in the 2000s. That really quickly followed in the pet food space by, you know, the premium kibbles you've seen. Um, the grain free movement, which, you know, now has a lot of a little bit of controversy behind it. But there were, you know, very equal, um, you know, growth stories in the pet food space where pet parents are finding stuff that they believe was more natural and better for their dogs. You know, pet plate has really taken that to the next level and offering human grade pet food, which is now the new and um, fastest growing category within the industry. And this is, you know, actually utilizing food that would be fit to feed to other members of your family, which is very different than how the pet food industry was been set up historically. Uh, so in general, the food is just continue to get better, continue to get more human. And, you know, we believe we're at the forefront of that trend change. So going into your, your company, Pet Plate, what inspired you to get that started? Thank you for asking that. So I, I spent some time as a consultant, uh, as I left college, I was at a company called McKinsey and Company and another private equity firm called El Catterton. And given my operational background, I was the lucky guy that got staffed at pet food factories. On the other hand, I also had a dog with a really sensitive stomach. I later found out that he had IBS and literally nothing in the market would work for him. One day, you know, after you know, my work with these pet food companies, I sat down as I was cooking my dog's food and I realized the ingredients I saw going into what was supposedly 
better for you and premium kibble would never actually satisfy, uh, you know, the health needs that you know, my first dog had. So that gave me the conviction to bring what I was making for Winston to pet parents across the country. And that was a start for Pet Plate. Uh, that start was in 2016. And I quit my job and started biking around New York City, delivering dog food. We were cooking the food in a local commissary kitchen. And with the success we saw early on, that allowed me to hop on Shark Tank. I unfortunately didn't get a deal, but that was enough publicity to take the business nationwide. And we've been growing and scaling ever since. And what was that funding process like post Shark Tank? You know, you're out there in the world, people know your name. Mm -hmm. What was it like trying to, you know, get those VCs to help fund you? Yeah, at first, it was, you know, a little hard as people looked at this category as, would people really be willing to spend this much on their dogs and, and, and cats? There was a little bit of, um, you know, disbelief at what we're trying to sell. Everyone assumed this would be a very niche category as opposed to being now the fastest growing segment in pet. Um, so it took us a while to find folks that really understood the pet space, that really understood the consumer space. But luckily, as we were able to continue to prove out our acquisition efficiency, able to prove out our retention rates, we've been able to have more and more success in the fundraising market. You know, we have recently closed our Series B at Pet Plate, which we closed last year, which was, you know, uh, just shy of a $20 million round. So we've had a ton of success and there've been other players in the space that have had even more. So I think that now everyone has this kind of on their radar as what's next in pet food. And I feel very confident in the next 10 years, this is going to make up a, a, a far greater share of the pet food market and really eat into what you know has traditionally been kind of wet food and kibble food that people feed to their dogs. So what exactly makes Pet Plate unique? Well, first and foremost, Pet Plate is a service. We're not just a food. So how you typically interact with Pet Plate is you hop on our website, you fill out a quick survey on your dog, and we use that to then personalize a meal plan for your pet. Now, each one of the meal plans will come with containers. These containers are pre-portioned based off of your dog's age, breed, body condition, and activity level so that you know half of the container in the mornings for breakfast and the other half of the container is dinner. And what's exciting about the food that goes into this container is it's 100% human grade. So we only use fresh meats, fruits, and veggies made in USDA, human grade facilities, literally using the um, same proteins you would be eating if you bought, you know, uh, uh, ground beef patties from Whole Foods. So this is what we're, where we get really excited about the health benefits we've seen in pets for eating a fresher whole food diet. And we make it very simple for customers to understand what they should be ordering. And then in addition to our meals, you can add organic treats or supplements onto your meal plan. So really it's a, a new way of feeding your pet it's an easier way of feeding your pet. And, you know, we, we really do believe it is a future of feeding your pet. I have seen so much buzz around personalized nutrition, just in general in mm -hmm. the food space. So I'm not at all surprised yeah. that it's made its way over to the pet food category. Mm -hmm. So looking forward, we've all been hit by inflation. We know that prices are rising. Mm -hmm. How are you preparing for that, knowing that people are, you know, trying to make their dollar last? Yeah, I think at Pet Plate, we're addressing it by doing the hard work of really focusing on our cost structure and seeing what we can do to make sure that we're generating savings so that we don't have to pass on increased costs to our customers. Things that we're really looking at as a growing brand primarily lay in the realm of vertical integration. So we are finding the ideal manufacturing partners in the human grade space that are able to help us on the procurement angle based on the other volume that they're contracting, but also are open to us installing equipment into their uh, facilities that is efficient, helps them with throughput, et cetera. So that's been our largest goal is how do we make sure that we have a very efficient supply chain. And we see a lot of opportunities as a growing brand for us to fix things that we may have only been kind of set up as a beta before in 2021 and 2022, that now we're trying to, you know, better operationalize and take to the next level in 2023. We're also looking at, uh, you know, more uh, cost efficient, you know, formats. While, you know, we love the flagship product that we have now, our fresh cooked, flash frozen human grade product that gets shipped to you um, frozen and then you thaw in your refrigerator. It only takes a couple of hours and then you can feed it to your, your dog. 
uh, we are looking at different formats that we'll be offering to our pet parents that will be available this year that will be a little bit more economical um, for people that have been hit really hard with you know what's going on in the overall economy. Great. And my final question is, do the dogs love this food? Oh, 100%. So I think the, the most hilarious thing I, I see is so my dog, Cooper, whenever I go to the refrigerator and if it's in the morning or if it's about five, six o'clock, you know, he starts this little whine that literally sounds like a whistle where he just knows that it's time for pet plate and he wants it. And I think a bonding experience we have at pet plate, you know, with all the dog owners is talking about the funny things our dogs do when they see a pet plate container, whether it's jumping up and down, spinning and chasing their tail. The joy we all see when we open up that container, I think, A, speaks to the quality of the food and how much the dogs love it. But I'll also say on a more analytical level, we've tested it against our competitors. We've tested it against kibble and pet plate typically wins versus, you know, like a dry food at a 10 to one ratio in terms of understanding how much dogs prefer it. And then some of our competitors are ratios of two to one. That sounds amazing. Ronaldo, thank you so much for talking with me and good luck with Pet Plate in the new year. Of course. Thank you so much for having us. Appreciate it. Ronaldo Webb is the founder of Pet Plate. The MIT graduate worked as a consultant for Catterton and McKinsey before founding his own whole food brand. Learn more about Pet Plate's startup journey in the February issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor. IFT First Annual Event and Expo. Registration opens March 1st, but you can preview the content and companies who will be at the event by going to iftevent.org. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine, or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.